camera headlines from the news of the day. U.S. bombers with the RAF hot on the heels of a routed Nazi Africa Corps, blasting the daylights out of Rommel's desert supply bases. Our camera plane has a narrow escape. It's glass splintered by machine gun fire. But the Nazi fighter goes to blazing death, a victim of Yankee gunnery. On the ground, through famed Hellfire Pass, the headlong pursuit of Britain's victorious Eighth Army is slowed by torrential rains that make a quagmire of the desert. But they're a long way from stalled, and the artillery hammers relentlessly day and night. With fast-moving advance columns of American built in threes goes General Montgomery. Wearing a tank called Beret, the Irish deacon's son directs the chase. Past Tobruk and Benghazi and on toward El Aguila, sledgehammering the foe without let up. The infantry, desert bitten veterans of many a fight with their backs to the wall, now write a chapter that history may well record as the turning point of this war, racing on the heels of the enemy. Yes, 
the trend is definitely toward taking the glamour from the gals and putting it in the job. This America 1943 is really dressed to help win the war. <laughs> Women's Day in the land down under. Red Letter Day for Australia's women in uniform, led by United States Army nurses. Those Yankee sisters of ours and their Anzac comrades are doing us proud. All Sydney cheers the Petticoat Army on parade. Even the Army's biggest ambulances are driven by our so-called weaker sex. The women of Australia are backing up their fighting men. Forward from Kokoda, feeding their way along treacherous jungle trails. Advanced units of MacArthur's Americans with jeep-toed big guns move toward Buna and Gona. Up to Jet Beach Heads at the toe of New Guinea, the Yanks push their way, then open up on enemy positions. Nippity's planes from the jetties of Rabaul bombard American small boats in the cove and score a direct hit. Our bombers have repaid this loss many times over. Out of the Buna jungle, native bearers bring wounded Yanks. The fighting on this front is grim. Jap strongholds have been taken only at the cost of sweat and blood. Somewhere out in the Pacific, Jap destroyer patrols run afoul of an American cruiser, and the Nips get there, but safe. Under withering fire, two enemy ships are sent to the bottom, and U.S. rescue boats go to pick up survivors. Contrary to propaganda, those nips like to live the same as anybody else. Not a suicide in a boatload. <laughs> the fighting is shipping Uncle Sam's Navy. Proudly wearing her wounds from the Battle of the Solomons, the cruiser San Francisco comes home. From the bridge of this ship were uttered those fighting last words of Admiral Callahan. We want the big ones first. And the San Francisco got three of the biggest. Yes, they've earned their homecoming. The San Francisco made history challenging superior enemy craft at point-blank range in a night battle. To 31-year-old Commander Bruce McCandless goes the Congressional Medal of Honor presented by Admiral King. When Admiral Callahan was killed, he took over and fought those Japs to a finish. He's ready to repeat. Realize there's a great deal of unfinished business to be done in the Pacific, and it won't be long before we're back out there pretending to some of that. Men to keep America's ships of sailing. 10,000 strong, they line up as a great maritime service training station is dedicated. This, the world's largest, will train some 30,000 seamen a year ready to stake their lives against Axis U-boats and all the perils of the sea. <laughs> Men who fight side by side with the Army and the Navy to deliver the goods for Uncle Sam. Photographed by a Marine Corps cameraman. 
Hey, Major Rickenbacker shows the strain of his ordeal by sun and sea, the second time in two years that he's cheated death. The famous ace of World War I lives with his comrades through an epic of fortitude, winning out over exposure, hunger, thirst, and the relentless Pacific. <laughs> Texas-born Captain William Cherry, 27 years old. The former airline pilot first rescued his weary but still smiles. Lieutenant Jim Whitaker, a Californian. They called him Iron Man. After 22 days adrift, he had strength to row. A comfy cot will look good to them all. Memento of their great adventure, the rubber boat that was their home for what must have seemed a lifetime. On its sides, they inscribed the crude log of their ordeal. Well, it's all over now, and Eddie will trade you the whole Pacific for one glass of plain water without salt. Thank you. <laughs> Victory report to the President and the nation. Edward R. Statinius, Jr., Lend-Lease Administrator, makes public some amazing facts about America's tremendous program of aid to the United Nations. This is a United Nations war. We can win it only by combining our resources with those of our allies. The value of Lend-Lease aid to date is seven and a half billion dollars. Our shipments of planes and guns and industrial materials and food have grown from small beginnings to the great quantities, which are now approaching a billion dollars a month. In the Soviet Union, most of the fighting has been done with Soviet equipment, but our aid has been important. In the past year, we and the British, together, shipped to the Soviet Union, over the northern route alone, more than 3,000 planes and 4,000 tanks. And land lease works both ways. In the North African offensive, our forces have been aided by the British on a large scale. We shall have to send more of many things in order to carry on the forward march of the United Nations. In addition, we shall participate with our allies in relieving suffering and distress of the liberated peoples of the reoccupied areas. This program has begun in North Africa. It will continue elsewhere and will hasten victory. Just such a transport as this was the first American troop ship sunk in the South Pacific in a year of war. The President Coolidge, steaming into harbor with 4,000 troops aboard, ran the mine, found it and sank. Below, the drama of rescue in these official Navy films. Rescue boats tossing on an oil-streaked sea, filled with Americans to be proud of. When the mine hit, they were ordered back to their quarters to speed rescue work. Taken off by units, as Navy lifeboats arrived, they waited their turns without panic, singing, even as they faced death. This is the happy ending. Of 4,000, only four were lost, thanks to their magnificent courage.
For eight hours a day, they push, a push, a push. But what does Mike do? Oh, he's head man, king of all he surveys. Sisters, this is war. <laughs> Douglas MacArthur keeps his eye on everything from the New Guinea battlefront to Yankee troop training in Australia. He puts the accent on hand-to-hand -hand fighting, just what they need for jungle combat. The infantry still carries the burden of attack in the bush country, where the Nips fight a sort of semi-guerrilla warfare. Mortar and machine gun experts clear the way for the infantry attack. Forward is the command every MacArthur man must learn, as the Japs have found out in New Guinea. We're aboard an American carrier operating in the South Pacific. Alongside comes a destroyer to transfer welcome passengers. The crew of a torpedo bomber rescued after a forced landing at sea. Ensign pilot Rodenberg is first into the breaches boy for the trip across. Saved because of a life raft that was made perhaps from the very rubber you're doing without. Well worth the sacrifice. The Navy has scores of such rescues to its credit. Transfer is made with both ships steaming at a steady clip. There's no stopping to do this job, for we're in dangerous seas. And so the names of three more fighting men are stricken from the grim list labeled missing in action. Time out from war for a bit of sport, and who said sailors can swim? Anti-submarine nets keep out the sharks, and you'd think the boys didn't have a care in the world. Now for some fancy diving. Finding the anchor chain, well, you don't have to worry about the morale of our Yanks. war-torn ocean. Welcome interlude after long months at battle stations. Symbolic of the day when the whole Pacific will become one great big Yankee swimming hole.
German dead litter bed gutters. During any lull in the almost continuous bombing, civilians search the pulverized ruins for whatever they can salvage. Smoking debris, where even a fragment of wall hides Soviet fighting men, death lurks in every alleyway, behind every battered door and shattered window. Under terrific bombardment day and night, a blazing city of tank factories and munition plants. Here, Russia meets and turns back Hitler's 1942 offensive. When history records the turning point of the United Nations fortunes of war, the chapter may well be headed Stalingrad. south of Vienna, on a strip of beach abandoned by the Nips only hours before. Fresh American contingents, reinforcements for General MacArthur's army of horses and yanks, moving in for a final drive to tighten the grip on the last Jap stronghold in Papua. The natives are invaluable in this new Guinea campaign. Moving supplies where a white man can hardly move himself, handling wounded with primitive kindness, guiding troops, and giving vital information on Jap positions. Well, well, the good old American game. Bullets for chips, but otherwise just like home. From North Africa, where British and American warships today stand guard over the sea lanes, come these latest official films. For most of the Americans, baptism by fire in the dark zero hour of that historic invasion, battle by night.
place them in the factories overnight and take the war workers of the factories and place them in the trenches and the swamps throughout the world and on the battlefields where we would double production overnight, at least within 30 days. Men and women of America, I mean that. I implore you to put forth every effort, a total all-out effort. Remember, no effort that you can put forth that doesn't equal those of our fighting men on the fronts will be sufficient. And any sacrifices that you may hope to make can never even approximate those of our fighting men in the hell holes of war. Gunners are right on his tail. They stay there till they 
shooting down. The heavens are peppered with smoke and burning lead. On the flight deck, we have to take cover. And it's rather hard right, as Carrier X maneuvers at top speed to escape the hail of jet explosives.
1943, the tide of war is running against our enemies. You then see Douglas MacArthur commanding the United Nations troops begin to turn the tide on the South Pacific, begin the Herculean task of hurling back the Jap, pushing through the wilds of New Guinea, across the hitherto impenetrable Owen Stanley Mountains, Yanks and Australians blast the enemy's last foothold on the island.
volcano flames still pouring from the smoldering hulk of a once mighty warship. Blazing contrast this to the gallantry of the World War Admiral for whom this suicide craft was named. 25 years ago, Admiral Graf Spey went down fighting to the last against a superior British squadron, not so far from the spot where his namesake lies, scuttled in the face of the enemy. In a holocaust of flames, the secrets of her construction are consumed. Secrets that made her the most powerful fighting ship of her size. Funeral pyre of the pride of the Nazi Navy. Funeral pyre of a sea raider that challenged the might of the British Navy and failed. sea level. Uncle Sam's bombers skim across forbidding Death Valley, lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, as army flyers test their ships in extremes of altitude. <laughs> Farewell silhouette on America's Sahara. Then the formation soars into the foothills, the badlands of song and story. climbing to 16,000 feet. Time for the cameraman to take on oxygen. Still going up over the Sierra Nevada range, unusually bare of snow for this time of the year. The objective's famed Mount Whitney, towering 14,500 feet in the air. A successful flight from lowest to highest point in the USA. Thank <laughs> you. 
of the very human greatest airship ever built is reduced to a red-hot skeleton. It seems almost unbelievable that anyone could have escaped. Destroyed by some mysterious cause, the Hindenburg Ghost Airship. Out of 32 dirigibles built, only two now remain. The one out Los Angeles and the Graf Zeppelin. A funeral pyre for many, but also a fiery monument to the heroism of Uncle Sam's ground crew, who faced death that others might live. for tonight. Bomb raid over Italy. From England, the RAF taking off to play a vital role in the Great Allied Offensive in North Africa by hammering Axis supply ports on the continent. Four engine bombers, Sterling, Halifax, and Lancaster on the high road over the Alps. 1,500 miles round trip from Britain to Genoa. Here is Genoa transport base for Tunis and Bizerta. by flares dropped to illuminate our targets. Two-ton and four-ton blockbusters hurtling down. Incendiaries unleashed over the heart of harbor installations. In what Rome Radio described as Genoa's heaviest bombing of the war. British blitz in slow motion. There in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, a shower of bombs ticketed for the shipping area that supplies Ramos Panthers in Africa and Goyling's air bases in Sicily. Each chain lightning step of fire, a series of bursting bombs. Six raids like this in less than a month. 1,000 acres of docks and railway demolished or left burning. All part of the plan of attack along the second front. General battered and ablaze. RAF is teaching Mussolini's deluded people what it means to take it. Cargo of bad medicine for the Japs in the southwest Pacific. P-38 Lightnings with a reputation as the fastest high-altitude fighters in the world. From an Australian port, they're told to assemble the coins to make ready for battle. American mechanics put them together. There's firepower aplenty, four machine guns and a cannon in the nose alone. Well hidden at secret air drones in northern Australia, they're ready for action. Here are some of the American sky fighters who fly them. Confident at last that their planes are more than a match for those Jap Zeros. Taking off along metal runway strips. Already they've met the enemy. The Japs have learned that American lightning strikes deadly hard and fast. <laughs> National Food Administrator Claude Albuquerque and War Information Director Elmer Davis announced rationing of canned food products. Mr. Wicked speaking. The method we are going to use in rationing canned fruits and vegetables will be the point system which is the best way I know of for getting the job done and still giving the greatest range of choice to both consumers and grocers. Pending the time when the program goes into effect, I am confident that Americans will have the common sense and patriotism not to hoard dried fruits and canned fruits and vegetables or any other food for that matter. If you want to help the access one of the best ways is to hoard food. Now a word from Mr. Davis. We are using our food supply as a weapon positively. So distributing it that the American Army and Navy and the American people will be well nourished. 
Yes, and so that the armies of our allies will be strong, too. This is more ration book number two, due in February. It uses points varying in number for different commodities. Your local rationing board will make everything quite clear. Meanwhile, buy carefully. Don't void. Be patriotic. Peruvians have something to cheer about. President Prado, three years in office, has brought new security to the Republic. U.S. built tanks and those famous American jeeps lead the anniversary parade. A dramatic example of how land lease is strengthening our good neighbors to the south. From the reviewing stand, President Prado sees a modern army ready to fight. Should Peruvian independence be challenged by any nation? Chile begins the new year with a great international exposition. The nation's fairest senoritas are on hand to welcome guests from all parts of the Americas. President Rios officially opens the Carnival of Commerce. At the United States Pavilion, he's guest of our ambassador. Good neighbors all under the flag of freedom. From the White House, broadcast to Americans wherever they may be, at home and on every continent of the globe, the President's holiday greeting. With the dark days of 1942 behind us, and a brighter year ahead, there comes his message of cheer. I give you a message of cheer. I cannot say Merry Christmas, for I think constantly of those thousands of soldiers and sailors who are in actual combat throughout the world. But I can express to you my thought that this is a happier Christmas than last year. Happier in the sense that the forces of darkness stand against us with less confidence in the success of their evil ways. With the President, all America prays for a victory Christmas in 1943. France's colonial legions come new brothers in arms for the Allies. Moroccan and Algerian units mobilizing for the Battle of Tunisia to fight on our side. Volunteers transformed almost overnight from a potential Axis army into reinforcements for our Yanks. From enforced collaboration with the Nazis to free collaboration with the Americans. They take their place with fighting Frenchmen heading for the front and they rate an American salute. French General Nogis and American officers in a supreme gesture of amity at the graves of Yanks and Frenchmen. With Admiral Darlan's assassination, Nogis becomes an even more forceful figure in African affairs. Yes, Miss America is out here too. Army horses who seem quite happy, far, far from home. America's own Brigadier General Jimmy Doolittle at 12th Air Force Headquarters, with which the President's son, Colonel Elliot Roosevelt, is seeing action. General Ike Eisenhower presenting the third star to Lieutenant General Clark, whose secret pre-invasion mission smoothed the way. Under General Eisenhower, the British, the French, and Americans are battering the Nazis back in Tunisia. And old glory floats proudly above the ruins of an excess dream. Visit the United States. The famous five presided five ship launches.
hatchings, each quint christening a ship. Superior, Wisconsin, another quint, another ship. A series of launchings and christenings. And so on, until there are five. Quints doing their bit for war tonnage, after which they sing a song, the quintuplets becoming a quintet.
That patrol craft is presented to the Greek government by President Roosevelt. There with the Hellenic ambassador at the Washington Navy Yard. The Greek sailors will now man the boat. This ship of war, built by American hands in an American yard, is delivered under the terms of Lend-Lease to fighting Greeks, wherever they may be. In behalf of the exiled Greeks, the gift is accepted by Ambassador Diamantopoulos. The Greek nation has been deeply touched by this noble gesture of a great leader and an inspired defender of the cause of freedom for all. The Hellenic sailors will take the anti-submarine speedster into the battle for the freedom of their country.